way, natural way to begin was uh, this week is um, the 10th anniversary of the uh, global financial crisis. And in the aftermath of the uh, global financial crisis, uh, uh, the president of the UN General Assembly set up a, a, a commission uh, to look at uh, a commission of experts to look at the uh, 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 global financial and uh, economic system. And uh, what was very clear about uh, the global financial system and the way it had worked uh, in uh, 2007, 8, and 9 was that it had uh, very clearly served to transmit a uh, significant disturbance coming from the United States and make it global and in some ways amplify it. Uh, and so uh, the Pro a question that was posed to our commission was what can be done to uh, reform uh, the global uh, financial and economic system. Uh, well, it's 10 years later, uh, our report uh, that uh, uh, Jose Antonio referred to, and he was uh, one of our uh, commissioners, um, uh, it's actually striking uh, how little has been done. <laughs> Uh, almost nothing. So uh, this book is actually uh, a good occasion to revive many of the key issues uh, that we raised. Um, and uh, among the issues uh, that we talked about are uh, the issues that uh, Jose Antonio was focused on, uh, the issues of the governance of the global economic system, this idea of a global economic coordinating council, uh, reflecting the concerns about the lack of uh, representativeness and legitimacy of the G20, and trying to get more voices into uh, decision making. Uh, the concerns about uh, the global reserve system that I'm going to focus most of my comments on. Uh, the problems of macroeconomic coordination, uh, which uh, the fail, you know, there was a moment after the uh, 2008 crisis where, uh, particularly Gordon Brown, uh, who was the uh, uh, prime minister of uh, UK at the time, managed to corral everybody together to have a coordinated uh, stimulus. Uh, and had it not been for that, I think people think that the downturn would have been much deeper. But it wasn't long after that that uh, that short period of unity uh, started to fray. And in particular, uh, you began getting uh, two very different views of uh, macroeconomic theory, macroeconomic policy, and it became actually impossible to coordinate. Uh, some countries, like Germany, began to talk about austerity, and other countries talked about the role of stimulus and Keynesian. So you had a world in which you had uh, really two very different uh, economic theories, um, and uh, no possibility, with, uh, given that, that conflict, of the world acting in any uh, coordinated way. Um, and I think uh, that contributed to uh, the very slow uh, recovery. Uh, another issue that uh, we talked about uh, in our uh, uh, report that came out uh, uh, in uh, 2010, right? Yeah, ten, ten, 2010, was uh, the cross-border capital flows. Um, and... Uh, uh, the mantra of the day before the crisis was you didn't need any financial market regulation. And I think uh, the crisis made it very clear that uh, there are, uh, that financial markets can't regulate themselves and when they fail, uh, there are large consequences for, for everybody, for the global economy. But even, recognizing the need for uh, regulation leaves open uh, an issue which uh, the uh, U.S. Treasury, uh, even under Obama, uh, could not come to grips with, and that is uh, 
Is there an argument for different regulation of cross-border flows from domestic flows? And um, I think by now, uh, everybody uh, recognizes, uh, especially with President Trump, the borders do matter. <laughs> uh, there are such things as nation states, and, and uh, treaties don't seem to make any difference, and things like that. And, and, and so um, uh, the good news on this is that uh, in 2010 and reiterated in 2011, the IMF came to uh, recognize that cross-border flows were important and that countries uh, should have scope for uh, uh, what was call, called current account management, uh, which is just uh, another way of saying capital controls, but it's a softer way uh, of saying, saying that because nobody likes the idea of control, everybody likes the idea of management. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, so um, the principle of the, uh, of that it is important to have some forms of cross-border uh, regulation, uh, uh, regulation of cross-border flows, I think is now uh, well accepted. There remains very important disputes about the magnitude, uh, the kinds of controls uh, of management with the IMF taking the view that they should be minimal. And uh, my view is that you need much more uh, robust systems and uh, not just using uh, price mechanisms, but also quantity um, controls. Uh, the, uh, there have been, uh, related to this, uh, large changes in views of uh, exchange rate management in general. Um, the uh, uh, general view is, of course, that uh, exchange rate manipulation is a bad thing. Uh, and that means uh, when other countries uh, manage their exchange rate, it's called manipulation. And when you do it, it's for macroeconomic stability. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but what is very clear is that every country has a wide variety of instruments to affect the exchange rate not just direct intervention, but almost every aspect of economic policy from interest rates to uh, regulations affecting what uh, foreigners can invest within one country and what domestic people can invest abroad. And all of those affect uh, the exchange rate and by adjusting those regulations, you affect exchange rates. And that obviously has very big effects on bilateral trade deficits. So, um, uh, and then final, the final issue is uh, one that had almost disappeared for uh, a, a decade uh, after uh, the Argentine, uh, Argentina's uh, financial crisis, and that was sovereign debt uh, restructuring frameworks. But uh, that issue uh, has come back uh, to the fore. Uh, the issues of, uh, you know, several countries, including Greece, have faced uh, issues of sovereign debt restructuring. And um, it's very likely that uh, um, with the uh, developing country crises that we're looking forward to, uh, there'll be more uh, debt restructurings uh, going forward. Uh, here again, there's been some progress. Um, in spite of the very strong opposition from the US government, including from the Obama administration, and that is that the UN in 2014 agreed uh, that there should be a framework, an internationally agreed framework for uh, restructuring sovereign debt. And in 2015, at the General Assembly meeting, uh, the principles of sovereign debt restructuring were uh, agreed um, I think it was almost unanimous. There were like, uh, six countries opposing. Unfortunately, they happened to be influential countries, including the United States. Uh, <laughs> uh, so progress has remained uh, in actually implementing these has remained very slow. But I think it is progress that there has now been well articulated a set of principles that almost all countries agree to and uh, where there's now work trying to translate those principles into uh, mechanisms of uh, sovereign debt uh, restructuring. Um, 
so uh, that just uh, and, and the, uh, Jose Antonio's book g tries to to reflect on on where the the state of the art today is in all of these issues. And um, as I say, I wish there had been more progress in the last decade, but it is really important that uh, these issues be uh, uh, kept at the forefront. Uh, I want to focus on uh, my remarks on uh, a global reserve system. And uh, there are uh, several reasons why uh, it is important, I think, for us to uh, uh, recognize the importance of having a global reserve system. Uh, the current system, it, countries need reserves to protect themselves against volatility of their exchange rate, of trade patterns. Uh, you can't get insurance. In some, at some moments, the IMF has tried to describe itself as insurance, but the premium, uh, if you want to think about that, insurance premium is giving up your sovereignty, and some countries don't like that idea. So uh, uh, countries uh, want to have some way of protecting themselves against uh, what would happen if there's a financial crisis if, if, uh, for which they are partly responsible, for which they may not be responsible. Um, and particularly after the 1997-98 East Asia crisis, uh, the recognition of the importance of these reserves grew enormously, and the result of that was the size of the reserves grew to something like nine or ten trillion uh, dollars. That has some very big consequences for the global uh, economy. When the countries around the world every year are taking income and you can think about burying it in the ground, not spending it, the result is a deficiency in global aggregate demand. And uh, you can make up for that deficiency in global aggregate demand in a number of ways. For instance, uh, it used to be, from a global perspective, you can make up for it by having developing countries spend more than their income. But the IMF has said, and, and, and I, I, countries have realized that's a very dangerous way for themselves because as the debts uh, accumulate, the probability of their having a crisis increases. And so the idea of uh, fiscal discipline has become widespread over the last 20 years. And so there is not the, uh, there's an asymmetry here. Some countries are spending less than their income and burying it in the ground in the form of reserves, but other countries are not spending more. Occasionally one does, like the United States has went on a spending uh, uh, spree in December in, Jan in 2017 and January 2018 and increased uh, its deficit by 3% of GDP in three weeks. Uh, uh, any other country that did that would be hauled before the international opinion and said that's totally irresponsible behavior. And to its credit, the IMF did say what the U.S. did was irresponsible, uh, but it didn't have much effect. Uh, so uh, the the uh, so but the norm well, outside of that exceptional behavior is that there's an asymmetry. Uh, countries are not spending as many countries are not spending as much as their income, and it's not being made up for by other countries spending more. And that leads to a deficiency of global aggregate demand. If the global financial markets work better, uh, you might have been able to what they would call recycle these surpluses. And at various times that's happened. But our global financial markets, private financial markets, don't work very well in doing that. Um, the par part of the problem is that a lot of the savings is long-term savers, like sovereign wealth funds and national reserve, and the investment needs are long-term, like long-term inf infrastructure, and standing in between the two are short-term financial institutions. 
And so that disconnect there means that a lot of the money that might have been recycled doesn't. So the net effect of this is that there is a deficiency of global aggregate demand. And I'll explain, and, 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 and the way the global reserve system addresses that is that every year you would create new reserves. Jose Antonio refers to them as SDR. I'll come back to that in a second. That's a particular institutional way of doing it. But you create new reserves. You give bank deposits to countries to spend to offset the money that they are otherwise putting into their reserves. So it's like creating, increasing the global money supply. And you can do that in the right amount to make up for the deficiency in global aggregate demand caused by the uh, reserve accumulations. So we're talking about three, four hundred billion dollars a year. Not a huge amount, but enough to make a very significant difference uh, for developing countries. The second reason for a global reserve system is that the current system is uh, very unstable. Uh, the current system, one country becomes the global reserve currency. And what does that mean? People hold that country's IOUs. And that means that country is getting more and more in debt. And that gives rise to what is called the Triffin Paradox. As that country gets more and more in debt, others may say, well, maybe they won't be able to repay it or repay it with currency of fixed value. So there is the risk of a lack of confidence in the reserve currency as reserves in that currency grow. And uh, if there's more than one reserve currency, views about the relative uh, merits of one versus the other can be very destabilizing. People say for one moment they want to put it in one reserve currency and then in another. So um, the net effect of all of this is that the dollar reserve system or the, the, the sterling reserve system when it exists single is, is potentially uh, very unstable. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, when you th if you think about the uh, consequences to the country itself, who is the reserve currency, it's a mixed blessing. Uh, you know, a lot of countries would like to be the reserve currency. It, it seems to be an advantage because you can borrow at low interest rates because people want to hold your, your, your bonds in reserves. But at the same time, the fact that they are holding your bonds means that you have a uh, current account deficit. And that current account deficit means that domestically, there's weak aggregate demand. And that was a problem with the UK before uh, World War II. And uh, Keynes realized this. And what he wanted at the Bretton Woods was to get rid of being the uh, reserve currency. He wanted UK no longer to be the reserve currency. He wanted to create the global reserve system that we're describing. But the US was not at that point internationalist enough to accept that. And so uh, the great swindle, you might say, of, uh, of the Bretton Woods was that uh, UK got the US to accept being the reserve currency. So it was great for the UK because they got rid of this current account deficit problem and their economy started to grow better. But the US got the problem. <laughs> and it has been uh, contributed to uh, this uh, persistent uh, current account deficit that we've had now for a very long time. Um, uh, so those are the two signs. You can make up for it by spending more than your income, which is fiscal expansion, but that means your debt gets larger and larger, and that goes back to the Triffin paradox. Um, 
just at, at, at in 2000, uh, uh, in the moments after uh, the uh, uh, financial crisis, uh, I began a campaign to try to convince countries to adopt uh, the uh, global reserve system. And uh, it was, with some success, we got uh, China to support it, Russia to support it, France, who was heading the G20, supported it. Uh, they put it uh, at the, the, they said they were going to put it at the head of the G20 agenda. Uh, and there was just one minor problem uh, called Obama. And uh, so I talked to him about it, and he said, you know, I, you know, I, I talked to basically the arguments, the, the two sides of, of it, and, and he really grasped it. And he said, you know, you're right, it's not so good for the United States. But he said, you know, I'm just too conservative for a big change like this. So it didn't happen, but it was worse than that. They put pressure on France not to have it discussed at the G20 meeting as one of the key issues. So um, it's uh, that moment of peak of discussion of, the, uh, of a global reserve system is now uh, sort of uh, uh, waned. Um, the, thir the third uh, reason for a global reserve system is the inequity of the current system. Uh, the inequity is the following. Uh, many developing countries are holding large amounts of US dollars in their reserves, large amount for their own wealth. Uh, and uh, what does that mean when they're holding reserves? They are lending to the United States, and they're lending to the United States the last few years at a negative real interest rate. Meanwhile, these countries are borrowing from the United States at very high interest rates. Now, uh, I've always felt the United States needs a lot of assistance from poor developing countries. Uh, we clearly need political assistance in our democracy, uh, but uh, we need, you know, but, but from any point of view of global equity, the fact that uh, we are getting uh, all this money and foreign aid from developing countries seems at the fa in the face of it unjust. And that, uh, you know, they lend to us at a low interest rate and we lend back to them at a high interest rate just seems inequitable to me. So the current system, I think, is fundamentally uh, deeply inequitable. So uh, I think there are compelling reasons for uh, creating uh, a global reserve system. There are many institutional ways of doing it. Uh, Jose Antonio is focused on one, the SDRs within the IMF. I think there are good reasons not to do it within the IMF. Uh, historically, the IMF has been tainted with certain uh, policies that some people may not agree with. Uh, and uh, this would, my own view is that it should be a basically uh, system that automatically creates reserves and puts them in the accounts of developing countries. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more tomorrow if I have time. Uh, um, I think it's particularly important because the major growth model that has worked uh, for the last 40 years, export-led manufacturing uh, development, is not going to be working in the next uh, quarter century. And there is going to be a need for more assistance. And this is one way of providing assistance in a world where the, the G7 has not lived up to their commitment to make 0.7% of GDP. This is a way of getting a, a, a fairly regular supply of money to developing countries. I would make it almost unconditional. Uh, and the only conditions would be uh, uh, um, that countries, uh, the main conditions I would focus on, uh, are focused on global public goods like uh, climate change, uh, nuclear proliferation, things that are, are a broad consensus within the international community are, are uh, important for uh, good global citizenship. Um, so um, I think uh, 
uh, all, the, all the reforms in the NANG system that Jose Antonio described are really important to undertake. I think this is one that actually is eminently doable. I don't think it's that difficult. Uh, and it would make a difference for development and it would make a difference for stability and for the overall level of ag global aggregate demand. Uh, and all it takes is uh, political will and having uh, the right president in the United States. Thank you.